magazine. The introductory issue had been a great success. While I worked diligently to make it so, the aging publisher's latest girlfriend, la diva of the cocaine-induced blowjob, who serviced him assiduously from beneath his desk each day during lunch, licked her lips sweetly and demanded my job. There was no contest. <laughs> After receiving the news, and since we were at the start of a new season, I was left little choice but to meet with the editor of our rival publication. Michael Ashforth was a tall wasp in his fifties, balding ever so slightly, his remaining hair graying silently. He wore a salt, salt and pepper mustache, reminiscent of the 1970s that he kept neatly trimmed. When he sat cross-legged, you could see he had a bit of a paunch. He examined my resume like a doctor reading a chart, while I sat across from him in an uncomfortable, cool-to-the-touch, middle-school wooden chair. He peered through the wire-framed pharmacy reading glasses that made him look like an intellectual, while his elegant, tapered fingers gently fondled the sheets of paper resting on his knee. I quietly waited for him to finish, feeling demoted and pretending not to care. When he was done, we made small talk, discussed the weather, where and how long I'd lived in the Hamptons, and then the conversation took a more personal turn. Where had I grown up, and was I married? I explained that New York City had been my home for most of my life, that I was divorced and childless. As it turned out, we were the same age, and we'd both grown up in the city. Coincidentally, his uncle's townhouse was on the same street as my childhood home. Since we appeared to be heading down that road, I asked about the photograph of the attractive young girl above his desk. With a note of pride, he announced that she was his daughter and the love of his life.